Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. It's time to choose another item from the George Collins collection for restoration. And up today is this Heathkit IM38 vacuum tube voltmeter. And just like the Heathkit IG102 signal generator that I restored a few weeks ago, it also turned out great. So let's take a look at the process. Let's do a quick refresher of the exam that I did back in my 1000 subscriber episode. It's in very good shape on the outside. The panel graphics, the meter legend, and the multiple tones of tan paint are still in very good shape. Now at first I thought this three prong cord might be a modern upgrade, but a quick internet search turned up Bob Eggweiler's Heath Kit of the Month article from 2016, which explains that the three prong cord is in fact a factory original. Also in his article, I learned that the IM38 was the last model of vacuum tube voltmeters that Heathkit produced, and not surprisingly, it has the best performance of the model family. It was available from 1969 through 1976. In that 1000 subscriber episode, I also did a quick visual examination of the internal conditions, and there were no surprises. It appears to still have all the original parts, including the big electrolytic can capacitor and the film caps. I did, however, miss this little nice detail. I can only assume that that's George's handwriting from over 50 years ago, and it's probably the date he finished assembling it. I love finding little personalized details like this. Okay, so getting into the restoration work. First up is to verify the condition of the power transformer. I had previously powered it up briefly on the dim bulb tester and I saw encouraging signs of life. But what I really need to do is to quantify the AC voltages that the transformer is putting out. To check the high voltage secondary, I cut the lead on diode D1 to isolate it from the rest of the circuit. Then I can slowly apply AC line voltage. This item contains hazardous voltage and safety precautions must be followed. If you're following along and working on your own version, you're doing so at your own risk. And then I can check the high voltage and filament voltages with, you guessed it, my trusty Heathkit IM13 BTBM. And both secondaries check out fine. Oh, I should add that I pulled the tubes before doing this, so both readings are open circuit voltages. Moving on, next up is to replace the electrolytic can cap. Like a lot of items from this era, it uses a chassis mounted multiple section electrolytic, three sections in this case. Here you can see that I've already cut and removed R6 and R21. They were out of spec and needed replacement anyway. Inside it has 80 microfarad C17, 40 mic C10, and 20 mic C5, all three rated for 150 volts DC. The modern replacements I've chosen are considerably smaller and are rated a lot higher at 250 volts DC. There's more than one way to tackle these multi-segment electrolytic cans. Uh, one method, of course, is to open them up, just cut around this ring and carefully pull out all the old innards and restuff them with the modern versions. It's time consuming and depending upon your artistic talent, you might get it to look almost like it was never touched. I've done this myself a couple of times and they didn't look, yeah, they didn't look too bad. It does preserve the aesthetics of your restoration, so that might be a, a route that you want to go. Still another method is to not replace them at all, but rather just reform the electrolytic itself. Now there's plenty of info online about various methods that people have tried, but personally, I think that approach is fundamentally flawed. We're just delaying the inevitable. These things are just decaying from chemical reactions that are natural. So you will get some more life out of them, I guess, if you do that. But of course, I've never attempted it, so my opinion on the subject is kind of limited. And then lastly, you can just remove the old can and fashion and structure to hold modern replacements like I did. Or maybe leave it in and just electrically connect it up uh, over to the side. But either way, you could put in a circuit board like I did here to hold the new caps or put in some combination of these terminal strips and I've done this too when space permits to be able to connect up axial caps or radio caps and it always it always depends on your personal preference and of course like I say on the space you have available on the item that you're trying to restore. I decided to go the custom PC board route. I started by making a simple sketch of the components and wiring connections in that area, then I made a tracing of the capacitor mounting flange and measured some key dimensions from it. Next, I whipped up a quick schematic in KiCad. Not much to it, just the three capacitors in R6 and R21. 
Here's the physical board layout. I went with 2mm wide traces and put legend text directly on the copper layer. See that 28mm diameter gray circle? That's the boundary that the three electrolytics need to stay within in order to fit through the 28.5mm diameter hole in the chassis. And just for giggles, here's what the 3D rendering of this board looks like. You can see here on the copper side the legend text that I mentioned earlier, along with my lovely trademark. So just like George, I'm leaving my own little bit of personalization in my projects. Now because this is front side copper, the printed toner transfer must be mirrored. And skipping a bunch of steps, here's the finished board. Not much to it. So why did I chop off the upper right hand corner? Well, it's for clearance. There's a terminal strip in that area that I need to work around, and just chopping off the corner of the board is the easiest way to deal with it. Here's the board populated with C5, C10, and C17. And on the other side we can find R6 and R21. I installed them a little bit proud of the board to help with air circulation. It dropped right into the chassis, no issues. Now you can't see them, but I did use a couple of nuts to provide some standoff space between the board and the chassis to prevent the resistor leads from accidentally shorting out to it. I used a G1852 diode here. It is overkill for this application, but I've got several in my parts bin, so no better time than now to use one of them up. Flipping it over, let's look at the tube connections. Now in this area you can see most of the other electrolytics, film caps, and a few resistors that I replaced. Whenever I replace caps, I try to position them so that it's easy to read the value and the voltage rating. Although I did forget to do that for one of them here. With the new components all swapped in, and with the two tubes reinserted, it's time to do a quick power on test. Of course, using my dim bulb tester. And good news! No magic smoke, and the meter needle is showing some response. Before I go any further, I want to let it warm up for a few minutes, and then measure the DC voltages at various points as indicated on the schematic. A couple of them I can check on my newly added circuit board, but the rest require flipping the unit over so that I can directly access the tube pinouts. This is a quick and easy sanity check to confirm that all the bias voltages are where they should be, and that the tubes are drawing reasonable amounts of current. And more good news, nothing seems to be wacky. But speaking of wacky, I'm seeing some very bizarre behavior of the meter needle during power up. I'm showing it here in real time so you can see what I mean. Now it's normal for these old vacuum tube voltmeters to display some erratic needle motion while the tubes are coming to emission, but holy cow, I've never seen a meter behave quite like this one. It kind of looks like there's some oscillation happening in the amplifiers, maybe as the various capacitors get charged up. After several seconds of this wild swinging, it does damp down and the needle does settle down to zero volts. It also does a shorter version of this dance when you switch from the 3 volt to the 10 volt range. Now that transition does change the capacitance in the input attenuator, so maybe that's a normal response? If any of you have an IM38 or its predecessor, the IM21, let me know. Is this behavior typical? Here it is all cleaned up and stuffed back into the case. There's a few small chips in the paint and some scratches on the meter face, but all of that is normal wear and tear for any piece of test equipment. Oh, and a word of caution. This terminal is labeled ground for a very good reason. It's connected to the case, and even more importantly, it's connected to the third pin on the power cord. More on that later. It's time to do a calibration on the IM38, and it is pretty simple. According to the manual, there's only two adjustments to make, and all I need is a very simple AC signal. So that's coming from my Simpson 420 signal generator. I've set it for 1 kilohertz output with a 1 volt RMS uh, value and I'm using the signal here in the background just to monitor the signal and keep track of the RMS and it's very small on the screen it's right there I'm sure you guys can't see that at all um, but it is right about uh, um, one one volt RMS and just as a sanity check uh, before I started recording I did use my basic very inexpensive um, battery powered multimeter just to see what it said the RMS value is, and it was very, very close. So these two agree to each other, so I'm okay using that one as the master to set this one. Certainly the IM38 is not going to be more accurate. Now another thing to be cautious of here, I've got two instruments connected to the output of a signal generator through a BNC T fitting, and one thing to always be cautious of is uh, interactions between 
your meters. And in this case, I'd be worried about the input impedances. And as it uh, turns out, it's fine. The output impedance of this guy is 600 ohms. It's made for audio system work, so it's really low. The input on the signal is right now set for one meg, and the heath kit, heath kit is pretty much about the same too. So um, there's no problem there. In fact, one way to check is if you disconnect here, I'm going to disconnect the uh, siglent, and we shouldn't see the uh, heath kit uh, change at all, and it and it doesn't. So just there's no adver adverse loading caused on the output because of these two meters. Now the calibration steps are easy. Unfortunately, I found a problem with the IM38. It's it appears to be a mechanical problem because right now you can see that it's reading. I've got it on the uh, what is it? The three volt scale. It's reading one volt RMS, and that's exactly what I've got uh, shown on the signal. I know you can't read the little display way down there, but trust me, it says one volt RMS. And I can adjust the amplitude on the Simpson, and I'm going to crank it up to about two volts here. At least I'll crank it up to two volts on the signal, and you can see that the needle is not going all the way to two volts. And if you tap on the meter, sometimes you can get it to, to climb up. But more repeatedly, if I overshoot, go up to about 2.4 volts and then come back uh, to 2 volts. And let's see where we end up here, if I can get it dialed in. There we go. Spot on. So that's telling me <laughs> there's a mechanical problem with this meter. It's got some mechanical hysteresis in the bearings and that's not good. Uh, I don't know how to repair that. I'm assuming it is repairable or cleanable. So I'm gonna have to look into that and see what I can do. But certainly that is having a noticeable effect on the accuracy of the meter. Here I'll do it again. I'll go back down to less than a volt. I'll bring the output of the Simpson up to right at two volts uh, RMS and we'll see where we end up. And we're short. Once again, I can go above it then bring it back down and uh, hit uh, about two volts right there and we're pretty close so like I say there's likely something mechanically wrong with the meter I have checked different voltages and different scales on here I know it's not an issue with the attenuator or anything with the electronics it definitely seems to be a hysteresis problem in the meter itself one more thing I thought I'd show before I get into troubleshooting what looks like this mechanical hysteresis problem is to confirm that the sensitivity of the overall circuit is working the way it should. And to do that, I set the range to the maximum sensitivity, which is down here. It's 10, millivol uh, 10 millivolts RMS. And I kicked in a 30 dB attenuator on the Simpson and dialed the amplitude down. And this will adjust all the way down to about 5 millivolts RMS before you can't get it any lower. So I've dialed it, dialed it up just a bit more than that at, to 6 millivolts. And the meter's showing spot on. Uh, now, of course, I've done some back and forth here to kind of take out that mechanical hysteresis as best I can. But uh, trying to set aside that, that, that issue just to see is the overall circuit working correctly at maximum sensitivity. And it is. So that, that's a good sign that the tubes are, are working well. The rest of the circuit's working well. I just got to concentrate on that problem. Okay, I've done some more troubleshooting on this issue. And I think I've made it better. And obviously I've taken the meter out of the unit. And that was on purpose because I wanted to be able to put current through it independent of all the internal circuitry and just see how the meter itself responded. And essentially these are just DC current meters. And for most of them, Heathkit put a legend right on the front to tell you what its parameters were. In this case, this one is 200 microamps full scale and it is a DC resistance of 1400 ohms. So basically, if you put 280 millivolts across this, you're gonna get full scale reading. Well, controlling 280 millivolts is very tricky and the smarter thing Thing to do is to put some series resistance uh, in the circuit between the power supply and the meter. In this case I wanted to be around 10 volts, you know 0 to 10 volts to get 0 to 200 microamps. Rough tough, that's about 50k. So I got a 40, 47k resistor uh, in series with my setup here. And of course the current's going through the basic um, multimeter in the background and it's showing about 64 microamps right now. And I'm at 1 volt RMS on the scale. The scale itself really doesn't matter in terms of units here. What I do uh, in order to see how linear and how repeatable the meter is, I adjust the voltage at the power supply 
to get to a reading on the scale of the meter and then look at the value back here on the multimeter to see what the current is. And so I've done that at one, two, and three on the scale, of course going up and pausing at the uh, needle, needle uh, position, look at the value, go up to the next one, get the value, and then of course drop back down and see where that hysteresis is. Now this is not a super accurate meter, there's no mirror on the background, so you can't really factor out parallax, so just trying to be careful and just keep my you know, viewpoint from the front looking at it. Got pretty close, and what I found here, uh, I could repeat the problem. So what I did was take the front cover off and very carefully, under magnification, look at the movement down here and to see if there's any debris or lint or metal shavings that were in there. I couldn't see anything, and I did a quick online search about what to, to do next, and really, you really don't want to do any harm to these. They're very delicate, so any kind of adjustment that you make is going to have to be minor and it's going to be risky just tinkering with anything, but what I did is I just backed off on the, there's a little tiny screw here that sets the gap of the bearings that are in there. I just backed it off ever so slightly, not even uh, a fraction of uh, maybe a couple degrees, fraction of a turn, just to lightly take the preload off. And the second thing I did is, I, since I had the cover off, as I washed it, and just some dish soap. And that was another recommendation to try to get rid of any kind of static that's built up on there because this needle, I mean, you just breathe on it and it's going to move. It's extremely delicate. So I did that. And of course, I let this air dry because a dumb thing I think to do is if you take it and just wipe it with a cloth to dry it, you're building static up on it again. So I just let it air dry for an hour or so, put it back together. And now I'm at a point here. Now, if I turn the voltage down, let's go up to, to one and see what we get here. So let me try to hit it right on. So it's 64.4 microamps. I go all the way up to two and then bring it back down to one again. 64.3 microamps. So I think it's good. I think there's nothing more I could really tinker with this without risking damaging it and making it worse. So I'm gonna put it back into the unit repeat the calibration and see how it does. All right, second attempt at calibration and things look good. I'm happy with how the meter's working out. Apparently that little adjustment is all it needed to get rid of that tiny bit of mechanical hysteresis. So same setup as my first attempt. I got the Simpson putting out a one kilohertz, three volt RMS uh, sine wave output and you can see it back here on uh, the Siglent. And I've got the IM38 set on the three volt range. And per the calibration procedure, what I would do is adjust this potentiometer. It's in the cathode of the 6AW8 right here. Um, it's R18 just to adjust the needle to get it done three volts. And I've done that, it's spot on. And the second calibration step to do is change to the 10 volt scale, first of all. And of course, the needle's doing this bizarre bouncing around uh, and see where it lands. And it lands, ta-da, right on three volts on the 10 scale there. So we're good. If that had been off, apparently what I need to do is just adjust a C2. That's this variable cap that's in the input attenuator to uh, adjust it until it's as close as you can get it to, to three. But it's good. I did not touch that control. It looks to be fine the way it is. So I'd say this guy is ready to go. I mentioned earlier that this ground terminal is connected to the chassis and the chassis of course is connected to the third pin on the AC power cord. So this uh, is going to have the same restrictions as most AC power to oscilloscopes, meaning you have to be careful where you connect the ground connection because if that's not ground in your circuit, you potentially could short part of it out or worst case blow something up if you're connecting it across high voltage or high current portion of your circuit. If I need to make differential measurements, I've always got my AV3 that I converted to battery power. That's floating, so I could use this wherever I needed to make a differential measurement. So that's all I have. This was a relatively simple restoration for this IM38. I do hope you enjoyed the material and enjoy watching my channel. So until next time, bye for now.